Hey, what's going on folks? It's Mike here and welcome to the next lesson in our modern C++ series. In this lesson, we're going to be talking about Lambda expressions. Lambda expressions are something that was added in modern C++ 11. So I really think of this as a feature that defined when C++ moved to this modern stage. So with that said, let me go ahead and show you what a Lambda expression is if you're not familiar with it, starting on our favorite website, CPP Reference. So go ahead in the top right corner and search for Lambda, and then you'll go ahead and find the first result, and it'll bring you to the Lambda page here. Now, a Lambda is something that constructs a closure. Okay, what is that? Well, we get a little definition here that a closure is an unnamed function, but I want you to continue fun an unnamed function object. And that's important in C++. I'm going to go ahead and zoom in on it so it's right there in front of you. Because we've learned about function objects previously, which are called uh, pop quiz for you, funk doors. So hopefully you paused and remember that. Um, but that's the idea in C++. So unnamed function object. And they're capable of capturing variables in scope. Okay, so we got to talk about what some of these ideas are. At the least, what I want to do in this video is just break down this idea of unnamed function object, and then maybe we'll touch on this idea of scope in this video or the next one, which you can look out for. But let's just go ahead and look at the syntax for a lambda here. And it's going to look a little bit weird if you're used to just programming in C or old style C++, and that you're going to notice that, well, to create one of these function objects or unnamed uh, functions, as they're sometimes abbreviated, we have brackets, we have parameters, and then we have the body of the function. And then we have some alternative things that we can specify depending on what we want to do with our Lambda. Again, they're very powerful in making use of a lot of features of modern C++. And that, in fact, is why we sort of had to wait till C++11 because, well, we needed a lot of these other features to be well thought out and sort of implemented so that we could take advantage of Lambda. So things like auto, for instance, are going to be really important for us. All right, with that said, let's go ahead and just look at an example where we can use a Lambda function and just sort of understand what's going on. And then we'll build on that in future lessons in this series. So make sure you subscribe for that. But in order to do that, where Lambdas are really useful is if we can use some different functions from the algorithm library. So over here, I've switched uh, pages to CPP reference to standard for each. And this is essentially what a range based for loop is, but it's going to allow us to sort of see how lambdas are used. So just a heads up, I'm going to start using more from the algorithm library because it can help us make our code a little bit more cleaner. And I think it's also just fun to learn. All right, with that said, let's get to lambdas here. And what I've got here, I'll go ahead and compile this example and run it again, making sure we're using at least C++ 11 for these features. I've got a vector here with a a list initializer to set up its elements, and then I'm using a range based for loop. You could add an ampersand if you want to do this by reference just to be a little bit more efficient, uh, but this is okay for the demo, and it's just going to print out the elements. Okay, so let's go ahead and try this with this new construct known as for each. So I'm going to go ahead and get rid of um, that loop there, or rather, let me leave it in just so you can see how it uh, compares. And let's go ahead and use standard for each. And this itself isn't really a new feature for each. It's been around since at least C++ pre-98. Uh, but it takes an iterator, so the start of our vector, the end of our vector, and then some function here. Okay, so now we need to decide what action are we going to do for each of our elements in this vector here, starting from the beginning all the way to the ending here. And this is where our lambda can be useful. And just to uh, help us out here, let's go ahead and copy in the uh, sort of specification here so we can remember what our syntax is without having to switch the page too many times. And I'll go ahead and just put a comment here and paste that in. And we could go ahead and see here. Now you'll notice there are some uh, optional things here that we can do with our, our lambdas. Uh, let's go ahead and just remove those for now and see the basic syntax here. OK, so we've got something known as the capture if we want to capture state. I'll talk about that uh, perhaps later. Params and then the body here. Let's just start with the basics here. OK, so what I'm going to go ahead and do here as our third parameter, what I want to do is just in line in this function, put in brackets to say, hey, this is a new unnamed function object and the parameters. Well, let's go ahead and what's the input going to be n some value because that's what I'm reading in one integer at a time here. And what am I going to do with that result, the body here? Let's just go ahead and uh, output whatever that value is with a uh, comma, one character. 
and let's just go ahead and leave it as that. And I've got to be a little bit careful here. Make sure I include a semicolon, close out my curly braces, and then a semicolon to close out this for each statement here. And just to make it a little bit more clear, just so you can see this third parameter, let me go ahead and move this on its own line here, just so you can see. Okay, so this itself is the lambda or the uh, unnamed uh, function object here. And let me make sure I did one more thing here. Just close off my parentheses so you can see it all working here. Okay, so let's go ahead and compile this program. Make sure it compiles and I didn't make any mistakes. Looks good. And I'll run it and voila, we'll see the exact same thing here. Okay, now why was this interesting? Why was this a powerful idea? Why was this better than doing things like this? Well, for one, what you're going to find here is that having these sort of function objects here, these lambdas, they tend to be very nice and composable. And also, I don't have to sort of name a bunch of functions or define a function to just print out an element here. Now, I could, and I'll show you how to do that in a moment, but it's kind of nice here. And really what these are going to be about is about composing programs using these small little functions as building blocks. Again, this is going to be sort of familiar to folks doing more functional style programming versus just writing loops everywhere and looping through our data. So I would argue that this sort of reads nicely, or as we start using more of the algorithm library, maybe this will be more of a sell for you. All right. But with that said, let's go ahead and say, hey, Mike, I really actually did want to uh, use this or write this as a function somewhere. And you certainly could, right? I could go ahead and write this function here. Let me go ahead and write it. It doesn't return anything, void. I'm just going to call it func. It takes in a value here. And all it did was print something out here. Uh, the value n, a uh, comma here. And that was it here. Okay. So for these things in algorithm, I could actually, and again, just to uh, compare here, Let's just go ahead and get rid of our lambda function. So I'm just going to comment it out for now. And let's make this a little bit bigger here. And let's just replace this with uh, func here. OK, so let's go ahead and re try to recompile this. It compiles and it does the exact same thing. OK, so we can kind of see something that's interesting here for where I use this uh, lambda function here. It's essentially replaceable with anywhere where I had a function pointer. Now, we'll want to see if that's completely true when we talk about captures and these types of things. But uh, I can essentially just do this substitution. So again, you can ask yourself, did I want to create this function here or could I have just put it in line here? And then there's another option that we could have done here, which is to actually define our function here. Because this is essentially just a function object here, I could actually store it somewhere. And let's just call it print and uh, one of the vector elements. And now what I'm going to go ahead and do is get rid of this function. And I'll get rid of uh, all of it, actually. And let's just go ahead and grab our code that we had here. And let's just go ahead and copy it. And I'll paste it in here. And now what I'm actually going to do is just use this little building block that I made here and just pass in the print vector here. I'm going to be being a little bit careful here. Let me make sure I uh, put a semicolon at the end of this statement. And now I can compile this, run it, and again, the same thing. So now I have stored here this function object in print v here. And I could use this, for instance, if I wanted to do for each again. So let's go ahead and just uh, paste this. And it should work just the same uh, as before here. If I go ahead and print this out and we can see our values, you know, printing out twice here. OK, so that's kind of nice here that I can actually store this. And again, you can imagine this is a nice way that I can actually uh, pass things around uh, and so on. But again, I was being a little bit specific here and because I had just done a video on functors, again, the previous video in the in the playlist, if you've been following along here is, you know, this is an unnamed function object. So I just want to go ahead and show you that lambdas are essentially the same thing as if I had created a functor. So let's go ahead and create a struct here, or a function object. Uh, and I'm just going to call this uh, also the same uh, thing here, or a different name, uh, print functor. Let's just give it a name like this. And uh, what I'm going to do is void. And for functors, right, we have operator with the parentheses, that's what we're overriding, one parameter. And for 
what the third or fourth time now in this video i'm going to define this uh again here uh it's just to print out something and let's just go ahead and uh the second time i'll pass in our print func door i can access it uh, just like a regular uh, function here with the parentheses and again we'll see the second time it's doing the same thing here so Again, what this Lambda is actually translated to, this code that I've highlighted, is this thing above here, okay? It's essentially the function that's going to be called. We can see the parameters that match up, and then the actual body here between the curly braces that we have here. It's just now we have the flexibility to be able to define these in C++ really easily. Now, what goes between the brackets is actually the uh, storage that we would want from some data member. So I'll give you a brief introduction to what this is. So let's go ahead and say I have something like the last result that I want to store here. And I'll just initialize that to negative one. That would be the equivalent of me in my uh, function object. Again, these things are the same, creating a member variable. And let's go ahead and initialize it to negative one here. And then within my actual uh, function, object let's go ahead and say last result equals n and i'm going to do the equivalent thing here maybe this time separating out uh, the lines just a little bit last result equals n and if i want to capture this value meaning that internally i'm going to change the state here so last result will actually be updated after this function is called down here when i actually do uh, print functor then what i want to actually do here is capture this value. Now there's a way to capture all the relevant values. And what you can do is just put the ampersand and it'll sort of look at this function uh, object and say, okay, last result, uh, that's something that I want to capture. Or we can be very specific and just pass in uh, a variable that is within scope here. Okay. And so that's what um, the uh, second part of this is here, capable of capturing variables in scope. Okay, so again, just to make the corollary, what this is doing here, what I do and uh, last result here. So by reference, I'm capturing this uh, result. I want to actually update anything that changes in this body of code. That's the equivalent if I had a func door here with this data member. Okay, so let's go ahead and compile this. See if I made any uh, mistakes here. No mistakes. This is uh, amazing. <laughs> um, and then let's go ahead and um, for our... Uh, our print V here, just to show you this capture here, let's go ahead and I'll get rid of this uh, second one here. And I just want to go ahead and print out uh, here. Let's go ahead and give ourselves an end line here. Uh, I'll go ahead and print out what the last result is. So just studying our list here from the last time that we ran, uh, you know, we should get a nine here printed out as our last result here, because that'll be the last thing that's captured here. And in fact, we do see a nine here. So that's kind of neat that we can actually just kind of build in or embed some of this programming uh, without creating lots of functions or having to wrestle with func doors in our code. We can just create these. We can pass these around like function pointers. So if you uh, like doing that or, you know, basically where we had a standard function, we haven't talked about that uh, is also uh, other places where we can pass these along. Now, the last thing that I'll say here is this auto again, what this is creating is essentially a a function um, object here, and it's deducing automatically the things like the return type. Now, this doesn't have a return type, but you can, and sometimes syntactically, you will see uh, folks put an arrow here, and this one would just be void here. So that's the uh, trailing return type here. You don't have to put that there. It's sort of uh, implicit, but some folks like doing that. Again, stylistically, and it matches what you'll see in uh, functional programming languages very often. All right, so with that said, we now know about uh, for each, which is a new part of algorithm. We now know what a Lambda function is, and I think it's easiest just to sort of focus on this part right now. We know we can have parameters just like a normal function. We've got a body of code, and then we've got some way to capture information outside of the function because, again, it's a unnamed function object, which is a functor. So we have these sort of uh, ability to capture uh, objects. This is essentially what C++, the, the compilers uh, implementing a Lambda as, uh, something that we already have known as a functor.
All right, so I'll go ahead and leave that there for a moment just so you can look at it or if you want to take a screenshot. Uh, but I hope that was useful. I hope this was a fun introduction to Lambdas for you. They're really a powerful tool. And really understanding Lambdas helps you understand a lot of the language, or at least kind of doing a deep dive, which is pretty fun. So with that said, folks, we're going to talk more about Lambdas and the captures in future videos. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss those. And thanks, as always, for your time and attention. And I'll look forward to seeing you in the next lesson.